So let's start with a very important question. When should we attempt to engineer shared ecosystems? Now, this is a hard question, and it's one best addressed by the local communities that are likely to be affected. And when you go to people and you ask them to share their concerns and criticism of a particular proposal, you get some people that are enthused, and they ask how they can help. You get some people that have specific technical concerns that they want addressed. And then you have some who question the very premise of the idea. That is, they want to know, how can we justify our apparent hubris in trying to engineer a complex ecosystem that we don't fully understand? Now, I deeply respect this particular concern because I believe that we are morally responsible for all the consequences of our actions. We are equally responsible for the consequences of choosing to do nothing. And many ecological problems around the world are severe enough that the moral cost of doing nothing may be too great. If you look at Hawaii, you have invasive mosquitoes spreading bird malaria that are threatening to eradicate the last few iconic native bird species. You have an invasive fungus that's attacking the most abundant tree in the Hawaiian forest. And of course, you have species such as rats doing what they do everywhere, which is driving many native species to the brink of extinction and over the edge. That's the natural world. What about human effects? Here in New England, our fondness for beautiful forested meadow environments has led us to inadvertently maximize the number of ticks and of the white-footed mice responsible for infecting them with pathogens that cause Lyme disease, and worse. So we in the Sculpting Evolution Group have been working on addressing all of these problems together with the local communities who know these environments best and will have to live with the consequences of whatever they decide to do. But what's really been striking about some of these conversations is how many people have said, you know, this town hall discussion about whether we should genetically engineer the wilderness was a lot more calm and reasoned than discussions about most cultural topics nowadays. And that suggests that there is something wrong. So let me try to explain from the perspective of an ecological and evolutionary engineer what might be wrong with our social ecosystems. Now, the first rule of evolution in the laboratory, when you're trying to direct it for a, for a particular purpose, is you get what you select for, which is not necessarily what you want. Now, this is important to society because of numbers. Now, please raise your hand if you like numbers. All right, I love numbers because numbers are solid, reliable anchors to reality. Without numbers, we're lost in the fog of unquantifiable uncertainty. We don't know how important anything we do is unless we can measure it. The problem is not everything is equally easily quantified. And that introduces bias. So, for example, we want to maximize human well-being, but that's hard to measure, whereas GDP is a beautiful single number. So we have economic policies that promote things like flexible labor markets. Now, please raise your hand if you were raised in the Boston area. Some of you here. Please raise your hand if you live within blocks of your extended family. A few. Within blocks of a trusted friend from childhood. Wow, some people are multiply lucky here. How about a trusted friend from college as well? A few, but not very many. That is, what we've been doing is maximizing growth, and the cost of that flexible labor market is measured in severed human relationships. And it's those relationships which are hard to measure which really make up the social fabric of society. So I suspect that a lot of the underlying cause of our problems is due to that fraying social fabric, loss of trust in one another. And only the most visible of those consequences, the most measurable, are things like the rising deaths from despair. So in short, economic policy is broken, along with many things like it that focus on numbers, quantifiable things like GDP, as proxies for hard to measure things like human well-being. And that may have worked once, but right now, it's no longer working. Another lesson from the natural world 
is that evolution has no moral compass. That is to say, that which replicates wins, becomes more abundant by definition, regardless of the cost to the greater system. If you look out there in the natural world, more than 40% of all species are thought to be parasites. Ecosystems aren't optimized for anything. And this is relevant to us because capitalism amounts to a clever way of harnessing evolution to satisfy consumer preferences. Anyone who can offer better goods and services that people want at progressively lower prices is rewarded with resources to keep on doing that. And you have a virtuous arms race cycle to satisfy consumer preferences more and more effectively. This is how we create wealth. And it works very well in some industries, consumer electronics clearly, but capitalism doesn't seem to be so efficient in others. In the past 50 years, the cost of housing, if you control for size and quality, has gone up by 50%. The cost of primary education has more than doubled, with no obvious improvement in learning. The cost of college and of healthcare have both increased by more than a factor of 10. Again, no really obvious improvements in outputs here. So what's going on? Well, you can say housing, that's an effect of limited land supply, growing population, especially near the coast. And you can excuse the others by saying, well, if you have increased wealth like we do now, health and education seem perfectly reasonable things to spend the excess on. But then why is the cost of infrastructure going up by so much? If you look at New York's most recent subway line, $2.2 billion per mile. That's ridiculous. It's an outlier, but it's ridiculous. And it's not alone. The trend is there. And this is strange because we have much better technologies for doing everything required for infrastructure and for healthcare and everything, everything from better computers to better concrete mixers. We would expect all of these to be getting cheaper, not more expensive. And it's not going to wages or even really to benefits despite healthcare. So what's going on? Well, again, in the laboratory, if you run a directed evolution experiment for a while, it might work great for a first few generations, but then eventually you're gonna throw up some cheaters or, and parasites that just feed off of the others. And as we know, if you look at nature, the longer you let it go, the worse this gets. So my suspicion is that capitalism and possibly democracy too have really just been infested by a proliferation of evolutionary cheaters. People have figured out more and more ways of cleverly siphoning additional resources off. And this breaks the system slowly, doesn't completely break it, but it makes everything more expensive and it increases inequality. And in turn, that contributes directly to political polarization and anger just because we're stuck with increasingly higher bills for the exact same services we used to get for much cheaper. So who's gonna pay the extra? It's a lot harder to reach agreement. So, at this point in the talk, you're probably asking, what can we do? Well, again, laboratory. How do you get rid of cheaters? We have a very easy way. We apply superheated steam and 30 atmospheres of pressure, and they're all gone. It works great. The same sort of thing seems to work for society if you look at history. That is, the reliable way to reduce inequality and remove economic rent-seeking is war, famine, pestilence, and mass death. So we really need some other solutions here. <laughs> and by the way, you should be depressed now. I mean, come on, these are some of our most ecosystems that we're proud of are supposed to be working in efficient and clever ways of harnessing evolution, and they're not working. So if you're an optimist like me, you're probably thinking, well, there's got to be some human cultural ecosystem that's working really well. And I'm a scientist, so I naturally think, well, science. Science is the crown jewel of our civilization. It can be frustrating and inefficient, and let me tell you from the inside, it is very frustrating and inefficient. It's very much a matter of one step back for two steps forward, but it reliably moves us towards a more accurate picture of the world. And that's amazing. The problem is, if you're a civilization, not all knowledge 
is worth having because science is vision just as technology is power. And it's the dance of science and technology that is the engine that drives our civilization. Without them, it falls and billions will die. With them, well, I'm increasingly concerned that we might inadvertently solve our rent-seeking problem. Suppose there is a discoverable technology out there, potentially in our future, that if discovered and publicized would bring down civilization. You can probably imagine some things like that, but the really scary ones are those that none of us in this room or anywhere else has anticipated. If that exists, then the current scientific ecosystem is highly likely to stumble straight into it without ever seeing the danger. The reason is that in an age of costless communication, we still do almost all research, including publicly funded research, behind closed doors, where everyone is blind to what everyone else is doing. And most research is done by teams of similarly trained specialists who can't reliably anticipate the consequences outside their own narrow field of specialty, which means if you have something that requires a synergy of this and that, neither team is going to know that the other is working on that, or even a know of the possibility of that kind of synergistic interaction. This is still very theoretical, so you're probably not convinced yet. So let me give you an example. Five years ago, no one imagined that we might be able to engineer entire wild species. But if you take CRISPR genome editing and you combine it with gene drive, which is a natural phenomenon, it's a strategy whereby genetic elements ensure that they get inherited. Put those together, and that's exactly the capability that we now have. If you engineer an organism so that it has the edited changes that we want in its genome, and we encode the editing machinery next to it, then when that organism mates with a wild one, the offspring will inherit one of each, and in those offspring, the editing machinery will convert the original version to the edited version. It's a find and replace, because the next generation is guaranteed to inherit, and the next, and the next, and the next. So four years ago, my colleagues and I first envisioned this possibility and its potential outcomes, and we were initially elated, but then very concerned. So we asked a bunch of experts from diverse fields, from ecology to security to even environmental NGOs, to see what they thought we should do. And we concluded that it's not very physically dangerous just because it's slow, it spreads over generations, and it's easy to detect by sequencing. And once you detect it, you can counter it with another find and replace. But it's very socially dangerous, just because, well, you can imagine the headlines if some scientist accidentally releases something into the wild that will eventually engineer that entire species. It would be pretty devastating to public trust in science. And as previously mentioned, we really need science. So how to stop that? Well, we decided we would publish our findings, our assessment of what this could do, and a detailed list of technical safeguards that should be able to prevent that kind of accident. The next year, the very same high-profile journal that published our warnings came out with a report detailing the same technology under a different name without using any of the safeguards. Now, I have no explanation for the journal, but the researchers are brilliant, well-meaning scientists who hadn't seen our work weren't even aware of the concept of gene drive because it's something for, from evolutionary biology, which was not their field. And they were just focused on building a better tool for laboratory genetics experiments that could be used by others. They never imagined that it could be applied to wild populations. So there you have it, a powerful, completely unanticipated technology that despite our best efforts, was still independently developed and publicized by researchers who were blind to the consequences. Do we have any barriers in place to prevent this from happening for a more dangerous technology? I can't think of many. So at this point, the question, can we engineer social ecosystems, is looking 
a little bit more urgent. That means I have a confession for you. When I say that I'm an ecological engineer, people laugh. And they laugh because we don't know how to do that. It's only because of tools like CRISPR-based gene drive, which let us harness the strategies of cheaters to alter populations, and by those populations, the associated ecosystem. That's the only way that we think we can do it now, and similar approaches. So the question is, can we apply this to the social setting? What is the equivalent? And I suspect we can. Now, I'm going to focus on science, because I know the scientific ecosystem best. Scientists, to be practicing scientists, we need recognition for what we do, which leads to continued funding. So if you want us to share our experimental plans in advance with others so that society can scrutinize them for potential dangers and intervene early, then you need to get the scientific journals and the funders to change the incentives. Now, speaking from experience now, I can tell you that none of them wants to be first. It's a collective action problem, so we need some way to get the wagon moving without them. I think the answer is to use a technology to harness a cheat. In this case, the cheat is intellectual property. Now, patent trolls love to use intellectual property to halt useful products unless they get paid off. It's a great way for them to siphon off resources. But if what you want to do is change the incentives, you want scientists to do something differently, well, how about you say, you can't do that research unless you first publicly disclose your plans. This wouldn't normally work, but we have an opportunity here in the form of CRISPR-based gene drive. So here's how it would work. To get together, get together a patent pool of relevant IP for building CRISPR-based gene drive. Ignore commercial licensing, don't touch that at all, and just regulate the research. But offer anyone a license for free, provided that they share their experimental plans in advance. This will be controversial because it violates this long-standing precedent, which has very good reasons behind it, that patents should not interfere with nonprofit scientific research. In this case, I think there is very good reasons to make an exception to that. And that controversy will lead to media coverage, and yet it's really hard to stand up in public and assert that you have a right to develop a technology that can single-handedly engineer ecosystems in secret without telling anyone what you're doing or allowing anyone to have a look and make sure you're using safeguards. So favorable media coverage will then incentivize the funders and journals to jump on the now moving bandwagon and add their own incentives. If it can work for CRISPR-based gene drive, then you have a precedent. And the strategy might then be applied to related fields involving technologies with shared impacts. And eventually, to most of the areas we're concerned about throughout the scientific ecosystem. And who knows, if it works there, perhaps it could be applied to the other ecosystems that we think may require a fix or two. Let's be fair. This idea could fail. It could fail spectacularly. In fact, most experiments in science do fail. But that's why we would then have to take a lesson from engineering. And that is, try something else until it works. And we have to do that because when we think that civilization itself may be at risk, the moral cost of doing nothing is always too high. Thank you.